book of Revelation, chapter number 2, beginning with verse number 18. And we're going to be reading all the way down to verse number 29. And what we have here this morning is our Lord's letter to the fourth church mentioned in the book of Revelation. There were seven churches that were to receive the book of Revelation that was given to John, and this revelation was from Christ. And contained within the book of Revelation were individual letters written to seven different churches. And these seven churches were located in Asia Minor, which is today modern Turkey. This letter is the longest of the seven letters. And ironically, it was sent to the church in the smallest city of these seven churches, the city of Thyatira. We don't know how the church at Thyatira was formed. The Bible does not tell us how. Uh, we do know that in the book of Acts, the 16th chapter, there was a woman by the name of Lydia who was from the city of Thyatira. She was a businesswoman. The Bible tells us in Acts 16 that she was a seller of, a seller of purple. And purple was in big demand, purple cloth. Uh, they manufactured a dye, a dye there in Thyatira, and uh, it was people paid premium prices for it. And she had left Asia Minor, Turkey, and was in the area of Greece when she encountered Paul. And this lady, Lydia, uh, God had opened her heart, she was a God seeker. Something had happened, God, I don't know what circumstance he may, he may have used, but she was thinking about eternity, and she was thinking about a holy God, and there were some women who had gathered down by the riverside for a prayer meeting. And Paul went there to that prayer meeting and gave the gospel to her, and she became the first convert recorded in scripture to be born again on the continent of Europe. And far as I know, I'm guessing probably most of us, if we were to trace our genealogy far enough back, we're probably going to land in Europe as well. So we have Lydia being the first convert to Christ recorded in scripture, and she was led to the Lord by the Apostle Paul. It may be that she one day returned back to Thyatira because she was probably in that area on business and eventually would go back home and it may be that God used her and her family perhaps to start this church at Thyatira. So there's a little bit of background. Notice with me here in verse number 18 of Revelation 2, and unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, these things saith the Son of God who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity and service and faith, and thy patience and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. So here in verse 18, the Lord, as he describes himself, He's letting them know that this message is not coming from John, even though John was the human penman. He's letting the church, a local New Testament church, know that this letter is coming from him. And he uses in verse 18 a description that is found in chapter 1. You remember in chapter 1, the Bible says that John said, I heard a, a voice as the sound of a trumpet behind me, and I turned to see the voice and he saw the exalted Christ. And we have a very dramatic description in chapter 1 of what Jesus looked like, using symbolic language to describe our Lord. And then in the letter to each of these churches, Christ takes one of those descriptions and uses it to drive home a particular point to each of the seven churches. Now, here's what I want you to notice in verse 18. The Lord Jesus describes himself as the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and feet that are like fine brass. 
Our Lord has many titles in Scripture. But apparently His favorite was Son of Man. Some 80 plus times in Scripture, the Lord Jesus is referred to as the Son of Man. All of our adult Sunday school classes at this moment are studying the, the Gospel of Mark, where Mark portrays Him as the Son of Man. And that title, uh, the Lord Jesus referred to Himself by that title. What, what in the world is that all about? The Son of God, true, referred to Himself more probably than any other thing as the Son of Man. Well, the Son of Man identifies Christ with us. The Lord Je it identifies Him with humility. The Lord Jesus stepped out of heaven in all of its splendor. He stepped out of heaven uh, surrounded by an angelic host and come to this sin-cursed earth, allowed Himself to be handled by the hands of sinners, to be mocked and ridiculed and eventually to endure the wrath of the Father as He who knew no sin became sin for us. He identifies with us. The Lord Jesus says that anything that you can go through, He can relate to it. He can relate to it. He was tempted of the devil. He was weary and tired. He was mistreated. He can relate to you and I. He's the Son of Man. Matter of fact, in Revelation 1, when this description is being used there, I believe the 13th verse, it describes Him as the Son of Man. But here we have a change. He's the Son of God. He uses a different title as He addresses this church. And I think there's some significance there. You see, the Lord Jesus is about to pronounce judgment upon a church. And rather than use the title Son of Man, He says, I'm the Son of God. It seems as if some of you at Thyatira have forgotten just who I am. I'm divine. I am deity. I am the second person of the Godhead. I am the one who died and rose again. I am the one who, who is eternal. And he says to that church, this message is coming from the one who is the Son of God and who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet that are like fine brass. What does that speak of? Folks, that speaks of judgment. I think most of us, if we had a parent or perhaps a teacher or a grandparent who could ever now and then could give us the look, just the look could make you straighten up. The look could give you, uh, could get your attention. Uh, the look is really important. It's very, very important. Uh, perhaps with dealing with children, you all, many of you are parents, and you know how to probably to, to give them the look, the stare down. And, and, and sometimes you can do that and not even have to say anything, especially, for instance, in a place like you and I are in public. You can't reach over there sometimes and whack them. Or they might be six feet away and your arm's not quite that long, so you just kind of lean up and just kind of give them the stink eye. <laughs> and then they say, oh, oh that there, they just communicated to me without even moving their lips. Well, the Lord Jesus here is being described as having eyes as a flame of fire. This is symbolic language. But what we're seeing here is the Lord is saying to them, I'm coming to you in judgment. I'm coming to you in judgment. Now, our earthly fathers, our parents, sometimes they could have been a little lax. Sometimes they could have been a little too severe. Sometimes they may even grabbed up the wrong one. It might have been that you were the innocent party. Or it might have been that you were the guilty party and you did not get caught. But with Christ, who is that perfect judge, He always judges on time, perfectly, to the exact extent necessary. He never overlooks anyone needful of judgment. He never gives judgment to those who aren't deserving. So here's a church that's getting a letter 
It's being read to them by the pastor. And as the pastor reads this letter to a local church, he says, this is from our Lord and Savior that has been given to me by John the Beloved. And as he begins to read, I would imagine most people's hearts sunk a little bit. When they learned that this was coming from their Lord whose eyes are as a flame of fire and whose feet are like fine brass. He says to them in verse 19 what he says to all churches, including this church, Mount Tabor. I know thy works. Christ, part of those flaming eyes, they represent his omniscience. God is all-knowing. We can hoodwink people. We can deceive people. We can even deceive ourselves. But we cannot deceive God. We cannot pull a fast one with our Lord. And he says to this church and to all churches, I know your works. And he follows the pattern here in this, this section as he does in all the other sections in chapters 2 and 3. He offers a church, if he can, a commendation. He cannot commend all the churches, as you'll see as we go along. And he offers this church a commendation. And notice what he says. He says, I know your works and your charity. If you're having your possession a King James Bible, that word charity back in 1611 meant love. This is a church that had love for God and love for people. It's ironic that out of the first four churches, this is the only one that's been commended for their love. That apostolic church, you remember, God condemned them for their decreasing love. He said to the church at Ephesus, I have somewhat against thee. You have left your first love. They had all kinds of works. They were busy doing things for the, for, for the cause of Christ. Listen, that Ephesian church that received the first letter, Christ praised them for being able to make a, a distinction between false teaching and exposing apostles who were not and prove them to be liars. This was a church that knew their Bible. They were versed. The church at Ephesus folks could win all the Bible trivia games. They knew the Word of God. But their love had waxed cold and they had reached a point where they were going through the motions. They were worshiping out of a sense of duty. They were showing up because they felt an obligation. The Smyrna church, there was no word of condemnation on them. That was the second church. They were the persecuted church. Oh, that church went through so much. And Christ offered no condemnation to them whatsoever because I believe in their persecution and in their suffering, they had a strong prayer life. They stayed close to Christ. It was the only way that they could exist, and he did not condemn them in any way. The Pergamos church was a, a sin-tolerating church. Uh, sin had begun to creep into the church at Pergamos, and then it just blossoms, the sin does, here in the church at Thyatira. But for the moment in verse number 19, he praises them for their love. They love people, and they love God. The only church of the first four to be praised for their love. They are praised for their service and for their faith, for their patience or their endurance, and their works again, and notice it says, and that the last to be more than the first. So this was a church who hit the ground running, so to speak. And as they were busy doing things for the cause of Christ, that as time went on, they didn't slack up, but they increased. It might be something similar today to a church who might say, okay, let's give a thousand dollars to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, an offering for foreign missions. But then next year we say, we don't want to do 1,000. We, we want to do more. Let's do 3,000. 
we don't want to do just an offering around Christmas time. Let's do an offering in, in the springtime. And, 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 and this would be like a church that just says, you know, we want to do more and more and more for the cause of Christ. And what does Jesus do? He praises them for that. They, this was not a church who was uh, looking back and say, oh, I remember what we did in 1975. Woo, boy, I tell you, we were mission-minded in 1975. This was a church that was mission-minded in 2023, and even more so. So Christ praises them for a variety of reasons, but verse 20 says, notwithstanding, here comes the condemnation. Folks always try to avoid excusing sin in your own life. Try always to avoid saying or thinking that if I do this and this and this, it'll make up for that. God may praise you over this and this and this, but He's still not going to like that. And sometimes I think, humanly speaking, we think if we can simply make up for it, if our good outweighs our bad, if we can throw some extra dollars in the offering plate or any of those kinds of things, it will somehow excuse failure, sin. It does not. That stuff has to be confessed. It has to be repented of. And Christ here, after He gives them a word of commendation, He gives them a word of condemnation, and it is a strong word. Notice it says in verse 20, Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess to teach and to seduce my servants and to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. I dare say none of you have ever met a woman named Jezebel. Right? You may have a Doberman Pinscher or a Bulldog named Jezebel. But I'm sure you've never dated or married or have anyone in your family named Jezebel. Now, we might whisper that when she walks off. <laughs> you shouldn't do that. But uh, we may have done those kinds of things, or we may have been knuckleheaded enough to call somebody that kind of name, and that would not have been appropriate. That name has been forevermore ruined. In the book of Kings, in the book of First and Second Kings, there was a woman in the Old Testament and again, the book of Revelation, if you want to understand it, you've got to be real knowledgeable on your Old Testament. There was a woman in the book of First and Second Kings by the name of Jezebel. Her husband was Ahab. Ahab was a rotten king of Israel. And he married Jezebel, and her father was a priest king who worshipped Baal. Matter of fact, Jezebel's dad killed his own brother, to be able to claim the throne and have power. So she come from a murderous family, and again, we don't want to hold anybody, hold anything against people based upon what kind of family they come from, but as you get to know Jezebel in Scripture, she emulated her dad. Ahab was a weak man. Oh, he was a weak man. Uh, spineless, uh, weak and basically what he did is he gave over authority in the home to lead the home to his wife. Instead of being a godly man here in the New Testament era, husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. Wives, you are to reverence your husband. And wives, you submit yourself to your husbands. You read on and the husbands are supposed to submit themselves to the wives. We're all to be submissive to one another. If you read through the book of Ephesians chapter 5, it's there just as plain as it can be. But Ahab was a weak man and a cowardly man. And the Bible tells us in the book of Kings that there was a vineyard, a man who owned a vineyard, and he wanted it. And he tried to buy it, and the man said, you know, this is part of my inheritance. I cannot sell this land to you. I will not sell this land to you. And it just ate him up, and he went home and had a pity party. He went home and had a big squall. And, and his wife said, well, what's wrong with you? And he said, Naboth, he won't sell me the vineyard. So... Jezebel got some false, some people that were willing to lie. Long story short, Naboth lost his vineyard, he lost his life, and Ahab grabbed a vineyard. She was a murderous, 
evil, evil woman. Matter of fact, when she, uh, Jezebel was the one who tried to have Elijah killed. You remember on Mount Carmel? Elijah withstood the prophets of Baal. It had not rained in three years. And, and uh, Elijah said, it's time to choose which God is real. And he prayed to God. He allowed the, the prophets of Baal to dance and chant and, uh, dance and chant and all those kinds of things. And when nothing happened, as he was mocking and laughing at them, he stood up and asked God to answer by fire. Fire come down from the heavens, consumed the sacrifice, the altar, and even the water that had been poured in a ditch around the altar. And then Jezebel sent him a message and said, Elijah, I'm going to do to you what you have done to my prophets. Elijah had the prophets of Baal round up and executed. And she said, I'll do to you by tomorrow what you've done to my prophets. And he took off and he ran. This was a murderous woman. This was a mean woman. Eventually she would be killed. And she was thrown from the top of the, of the building splat onto the ground and it was prophesied that the dogs would eat her flesh and that's exactly what happened when Jehu come riding into town he said throw her out they threw her out and he entered into the city and then when he come back out he said we need to take care and give her a burial because she was a queen and they found very little to bury that's Jezebel what was that Jezebel doing well that Jezebel was getting the people of Israel to worship Baal, to worship false gods, to get involved in, in sexual immorality and all those kinds of things. So no one probably has worn that name too much. So here in verse number 20, this woman's name probably was not Jezebel, although it could have been. But very likely this woman is called Jezebel in Scripture simply to reveal her character. To reveal her character. Just like today we don't name our boys Judas. Because Judas messed up that name as he betrayed our Lord for 30 pieces of silver. I would say in Germany today, very few people call their sons Adolf. That name has been forever ruined. So some names sometimes get destroyed based upon the people who have warned them. But you'll notice in verse 20, she described herself as a prophetess. She called herself a prophetess. And as she was in this church, she did this. She taught people, she seduced people to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now in the city of Thyatira, they had guilds, they had labor guilds. And if you wanted to go anywhere in your profession, if you wanted to make a living, it was expected that you would get involved in the worship of the God of each of the individual guilds. This woman probably very smoothly, very subtly said, you got to feed your family, you got to compromise. If you're going to get along with the world, you need to look like the world and do some of the things that the world does. And she was getting these people to get involved into fornication because that was a part of the false god worship. They even had temple prostitutes and all of this. So we're talking about very gross, sinful behavior. And this woman had crept into the church. And rather than being silenced by the church, the leadership of the church saying, this cannot be, it was tolerated. It was tolerated. Sin and false teaching were tolerated. They were compromising with her, and the world had come into the church. Now, folks, I want to point something out about these two churches. Let's, for instance, the church at Ephesus and the church of Thyatira. The church at Ephesus was very good at saying, you're not an apostle. You're an imposter. What you're teaching is false. But they didn't have any love. Their love was waning. This church had a lot of love but they never said anything as far as correcting. You think about a parent who never disciplines a child. I even, 25 years in education, had a dad say one time, I, I just loved my son too much to ever spank him. By the time he got to high school, that kid was rotten. Rotten. And the dad expressed to me that maybe he had made a mistake never spanking his child 
that as he was growing up, he never, never disciplined him. He never spanked him, and, and he questioned whether or, not, if, whether or not that was the best thing to do. Well, by that time, the kid was bigger than he was. <laughs> when he come to the realization that maybe he should have taken a different path in parenting, it, it, was, it, was, it was too late. A little swat on the leg is not child abuse. It's not going to hurt them. It's probably going to help them. And uh, we're not talking about beating. We're talking about discipline. But anyway, moving on here in verse number 20. Jezebel here, in the name of love perhaps, had not been disciplined. She had not been rebuked over her teaching of idolatry and immorality. She had not been rebuked. And a church is no better to have a commitment to orthodox faith without love than it is to have love and no allegiance to the word. You need them both. We need to have love. We need to have truth spoken in love. Truth spoken in love. As a parent, sometimes I goofed. Disciplining my three, sometimes I goofed. Sometimes I did good, did well. Sometimes I goofed. But when I did well, here's what I tried to do. When I needed to correct my children, I could be, I have a look that could, that could be scary. <laughs> and uh, when I could speak to them, I seldom yelled, really, did, I seldom yelled, but my, I'd grind my teeth almost down to the gum as I was speaking to them with a calm voice. <laughs> and I could look at them and my jaw would be clenched. And then I might say, now here's how things are going to be. I remember one time I had one of them's cell phone and computer and everything they enjoyed. It went to my bedroom every night and it slept with me for a month. I took everything they owned. And there are other times I took the belt. But whenever we did that, when that was over with, I tried to take a deep breath and hug them. And say, I love you. I love you. And I made them stay there and hug me back. <laughs> they couldn't walk away until they hugged me back. Even though I had to give them some discipline, I also wanted them to know that the reason I was doing it was because I loved them. And if my heart was right, it wasn't because I was angry and mad and wanted to get even. It was because I wanted them to be a better person. But you got to do that in love. You got to do it in love. The Ephesus church lacked love, and they may have called people down. They may have even called them down pretty viciously and did so without love. This church never called anybody down, but they had hot, lots of love. Both situations are wrong. Both situations are wrong. Verse 21 God's amazing grace. I gave her space to repent. This is Jesus speaking. I gave her space to repent of her fornication. She repented not. Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and all that commit adultery with her in the great, into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts. And I will give unto them, every one of them, every one of you, according to your works. Now, what is this all about? Is the Lord Jesus killing little children? That's not what this is talking about. What this is talking about is those that follow her teaching. Those who practice what she has been teaching and who give in to the ways of the world and become very worldly and immoral. God says, I will kill them with death. You say, wow, that's pretty harsh. Well, in 2 Corinthians, or excuse me, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, if I can find it real quick. 
1 Corinthians chapter number 11, verses 28 through 30. I read this not too many months ago regarding the Lord's table when you and I celebrate communion. Here's what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 28 through 30 as he wrote this to a church at Corinth. But let a man examine himself, let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup, for he that drink, eats or drinks unworthily eats and drinks damnation to himself, judgment, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Paul said to the Corinthian church who had all kinds of problems. Oh, I'm telling you, the Corinthian church, they had sexual immorality. They had lawsuits among the, the, the brethren suing one another. They had, oh, Paul's my preacher and Peter's my preacher. And, oh, he can't preach. I, I mean, they just, you name it, buddy. I'm telling you, they could have made a soap opera out of the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians. And Paul said, some of you are dealing with illness because of the sin in your life, because of the way you have approached the table. And he said, some of you are no more because God has killed you. There have been funerals in the church at Corinth because of their sinfulness. So when God says in verse 23 of Revelation 2, I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and the hearts. That rain means kidneys. It means that God knows you inside and out. He knows your inner man, what's, what really makes you tick. He knows who you are in private. He knows who you are when nobody else is around. Christ says, I know that. And because of these things, because you're not of a pure heart, because you've given in to immorality and false worship, and because you have refused my call to repentance, I'm bringing judgment. There's a lesson for the judgment. I have one sibling. I have a brother, 13 months younger than me. When I saw him get torn up by my father with his old leather belt, that always made me decide not to do what he just did. I'm not the smartest guy around, but I did have enough sense to know if that's what's going to happen, I don't think I'm going to do it. We had a young lady on our, well, I wouldn't say a lady. We had a girl on our street growing up. I grew up a little bit in town, then we moved to the country, and that was the best move ever when we moved to the country. But she was a couple of years older than us, and she was mean as a snake. Oh, that girl was mean. And we were mean, too. But she was a couple of years older than us, and uh, she was not a, especially an attractive girl at all. And she had a particular physical feature, and one day my brother, and I didn't like the girl because, I mean, she could put a whooping on us. <laughs> She'd throw pears at us and hit us in the head with pears, and it was war. But one day she, she conked us with some pears, and my brother sat it off. He, he picked out a, that physical appearance about her and let it go. And my mother heard it. And I was about to let it go, too, because when he said it, I was getting ready. And she said, I'm going to tell your daddy. I thought I'd keep that to myself. <laughs> and when my daddy got home, I think he got the worst beating I'd ever seen my brother get. And I just kind of sat there in the swing on the porch. He said, did you say anything? No, sir. I was thinking about it, but I didn't. <laughs> but he wore my brother. I mean, he just over and over. He said, don't you ever say anything about a way a person looks. They can't help how they look. You don't ever, ever do that again. She hits you in the head with a pear, throw it back. But you don't say anything about how a person looks. Well, I learned from it. Well, listen, verse 23. Christ says, all the churches will know what I have done to you. All the churches will know. Look at it. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he who searches the innermost part of a person searches the reins and the hearts and I will give every one of these a, a, according to your works verse 24 but unto you I say and unto the rest in Thyatira as many as have not this doctrine which have not known the depths of Satan as they speak I will put upon you none other burden but that which you have already hold but that which you have already hold fast till I come he said for the rest of you the remnant 
who have not succumbed to doing what all these other people were doing. He said, just keep doing what you were doing in verse number 19. He said, I'm not going to add any more to your burden. Just keep on with the works and the faith and the love and the service. Keep allowing your last works to be greater than your first work. He said, I'm not going to put any greater burden on you than that. Simply hold fast till I come. He says in verse 27, verse 26, excuse me, verse 26, And he that overcometh, and keepeth my words unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessel, vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers, even as I received of my father. Verse 26 and 27 is saying uh, a reward. Christ is announcing a reward to those who hold fast till he comes. He's not saying that you and I are going to be governors and presidents and senators and those kinds of things. But he's saying in verse number 26 that during his millennial reign, when Christ comes back at the end of the tribulation and sets up his millennial reign on earth for a thousand years, you and I will be with him in his glorified body. You and I will be with him in glorified bodies, and at that time we're going to be able to shepherd the Finally, in verse 28 and 29, and I will give them the morning star. That's a reference to Jesus Christ, Revelation 22 and 16. I will give him the morning star, and he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Brother Thad, you come. I feel like you and I have, we can come to this agreement. Uh, we don't want to... Uh, be the church that gets judged harshly. We don't want to be that church. I don't want the condemnation. I'd love for my Lord to give me a commendation. The Bible does say that one day we'll hear the words, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Christ will say that to some, and I want to hear that. I want to hear that. I don't want to hear, I will do something for you so that you can be an example to the other churches. <laughs> so what we need to do is to do right. Let's do right.